no, don't forget. Here with Mr. Jack Benny in a highly unusual fantasy about an angel who was sent down from higher places to destroy the earth. A story which contains more than first meets the ear. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Benley finally got here. And tonight we present him with Mr. Claude Rains in, of all things, The Horn Blows at Midnight. This is the Ford Theater. <laughs> Welcome to a full hour of the finest dramatic entertainment with celebrated stars of Broadway and Hollywood. Presented by the Ford Motor Company, builder of Ford cars, Ford trucks and farm tractors, Lincoln and Mercury cars, including the new 1949 Lincoln Cosmopolitan, America's most distinctive fine car, unrivaled for superb performance and luxurious appointments. Now to introduce this evening's program, here is the director of the Ford Theater, Fletcher Markle. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, all disputes, all threats, pleadings, persuasions, and all kidding aside, we're proud and pleased to welcome to the Ford Theater one of the great comedians of the world, Mr. Jack Benny. (laughs) Co-starring with Mr. Benny in the long-heralded Horn Blows at Midnight, we're very happy to have with us one of the most accomplished actors of Broadway and Hollywood, Mr. Claude Rains. This is the second program, by the way, in our Festival of Smiles, which concludes next week with Mr. Bing Crosby. (laughs) The theme of the Warner Brothers picture on which tonight's broadcast is based caused much comment when it was released some seasons ago. Being a fantasy having to do with the destruction of the Earth, the picture clearly raised a controversial issue. And we of the Ford Theater firmly believe that while a radio version of The Horn Blows at Midnight will not end any arguments, it will at least add zest to them. So come with us beyond the Earth's atmosphere on counted light years through space to a place very high above us, the office of the Chief of the Small Planets, an important executive in the system of the universe. You'll be hearing Claude Rains as the Chief with Mr. Benny as a minor angel named Nathaniel. And, of course, any similarity between these characters and any characters living is quite impossible. (laughs) Mr. Benny, Mr. Rains and company, please to begin. Horatio, I tell you, something has to be done about it. Here it is, 1949, and that dreadful little planet is worse off than it ever was. What's the name of it again? Number 33974. It is called Earth. Oh, yes. Nasty little globe. It's always giving me trouble, but now it's absolutely out of hand. Two world wars, persecution, hatred everywhere. Greed, intolerance, bloodshed. I'm just about fed up. What are you going to do, Chief? I'm going to destroy it, Horatio. I'm going to wipe it off the face of the... Uh, uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to destroy it. Without any warning? Well, the front office has warned them often enough. Quakes, floods, droughts, plagues, everything. But they pay no attention. Those Earth people aren't satisfied with making a mess of their own planet. Why, they're even working on rockets to get to the moon. What do they want up there, Chief? Oh, I don't know. Maybe they're overloaded with the Ritz crackers and they believe that stuff about the moon being made of a green cheese. <laughs> I'll bust for Elizabeth, my secretary. I'm going to settle this once and for all. Did you ring, Chief? Yes, come in, Elizabeth. I want you to take down some notes. I'm destroying one of the smaller planets, and I want you to send copies to the recording angel. Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? It won't make a hit with the recording department. They're swamped with work. Oh, it's always something. What's their complaint? Same old thing. Shortage of angel power. I'm drawing up a new personnel questionnaire. Another one? Hmm. More red tape. I never saw such incompetence, such inefficiency. You know, this place needs a few big businessmen to run things up here. We need them, and they better start letting them in. That's all I've got to say. What planet are you destroying, Chief? 33974. It's called Earth. Earth? Well, that was created rather hurriedly, as I remember. Yes, it was a six-day job. (laughs) Practically slapped together. Well, I'm going to slap it apart. How are you going to do it, Chief? Well, usually our demolition expert descends, blows his horn, and poof. Just poof? Well, for some of the larger jobs, it's poof, poof. (laughs) But this happens to be a one-poof planet. Anyway, our demolition expert is busy on another assignment, and I'll have to find someone else. Elizabeth, who would you suggest? What about a Thaniel? A Thaniel? 
That nincompoop, that blundering nitwit. <laughs> he's not a nincompoop, and he's not a nitwit either. And you shouldn't call him those names, Chief. Remember, he's an angel. Some angel. I don't see how he ever got his wings. <laughs> Elizabeth, what do you see in him anyway? Well, he's sweet and kind and understanding, and he plays the trumpet beautifully. That's right. He does play, doesn't he? He's been 455th trumpet in the Ethereal Philharmonic Orchestra for over 300 years. Then he certainly ought to be able to blow the horn. Go fetch him, Elizabeth. I will, Chief, immediately. He's rehearsing with the orchestra now. <laughs> Nathaniel, please. Once again, gentlemen, and all together this time. Nathaniel, step up here, please. Yes, Mr. Beethoven. Uh, what is it, sir? For 120 years I've been conducting this orchestra. And for 120 years you've been playing the wrong notes. Why? Tell me why. Well, it's, it's a hard number and it takes practice. I'm sure I'll get it if you'll just be patient a little while longer. A little while longer? Yeah, besides, what's the rush? We're not going anywhere. <laughs> what has that got to do with it? We've got 10,000 men in this orchestra, 9,999 musicians, and you. Huh? Why did you have to take up the trumpet? With lips like yours, you should be a glass blower. A glass blower? Yeah, I tried that when I was on Earth. But one day, instead of blowing, I inhaled. <laughs> Then I had to walk around with a sign on my back, marked Fragile. <laughs> Look, Nathaniel, I don't care what happened to you on Earth. I only care what happens to me up here. Now go back to your place and please don't be flat. But Mr. Beethoven, the music says B flat, doesn't it? <laughs> that doesn't mean you should be flat. That means play B flat. Oh, oh I wish I'd have known that a hundred years ago. <laughs> Could have saved so much trouble. All right, Mr. Beethoven, I promise you. Nathaniel! Nathaniel! Huh? Oh, hello, Nathaniel, Elizabeth. I have wonderful news for you. The chief wants to see you. The chief? Is there something wrong? What do I do now? Oh, Nathaniel, don't be silly. You couldn't do anything wrong. Oh, no? If you don't think so, stay around and listen to him play the trumpet. <laughs> it's better he should have the mute in his mouth. I don't use a mute. I use a derby. <laughs> Gee, Elizabeth, I'm so excited. Imagine the chief wanting to see me. How do I look? Fine, fine. I'm so nervous. Is my halo on straight? Oh, it's perfect. Now, come on. Don't keep him waiting. All right. Will you excuse me, Mr. Beethoven? With pleasure. All right, gentlemen. Now we can play. <laughs> Elizabeth, it's been so long since I've seen the chief, I, I won't know how to act. Just be yourself, and don't let him frighten you. If he seems gruff, it's only because he's terribly busy, like all the other deputy chiefs. He has billions of small planets to look after. I know, what a job that must be, keeping them in their own orbits. Well, we're almost there, and I'm so nervous. Hello, Elizabeth! Hello, Daniel! Hello, Hello. Paul! <laughs> Hello, Mr. Yeah, it's a beautiful horse Mr. Revere rides. I wonder why he still carries those two lanterns. Nathaniel, yeah? you can ask him later. We haven't got time now. The chief is waiting. Oh. Uh... Horatio, you may not realize it, but getting rid of the earth will be a big help in balancing the budget. Think of all the rain and snow we'll save. Uh, yes, that is an item. And don't forget the thunder and lightning that little planet uses up. Why, we'll cut our electric bills in half. 
And, oh, uh, by the way, Horatio, remind me to talk to Halley about his comet. There's no point to its traveling around the Earth anymore. Uh, yes, Chief. Oh, here comes Elizabeth with Nathaniel. Yeah, about time. Let him in. Here's Nathaniel, Chief. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, he hasn't changed a bit. Oh, well. Nathaniel, how long have you been up here? Uh, 300 years, Chief. I'm from New Amsterdam, you know. Hmm. Hmm. What's your rank? Angel, junior grade, third phalanx, 15th cohort. <laughs> Still junior grade, eh? I don't know why I sent for you. Was it possibly about changing my rank, sir? No, no, I see no reason for demoting you. Thank you, Chief. <laughs> I've been going over your record, and it's not too bad. It says here, deportment B, application B, virtue A, mentality... Well, this job doesn't require a genius anyway. <laughs> You'll do. Do what, sir? Do what? Destroy planet number 33974. 33974? Why, that's Earth, my home planet. What will all those people do without it? Where will they live? Well, some of them will come up here and some of them will go to the other place. We have no time for sentiment. But, Chief, why are you destroying the Earth? Why? Simply because there's been nothing but trouble there. Now that the Second World War is over, it's in a bigger mess than it ever was. No peace, no harmony, no cooperation. If they want to end civilization, I'll end it for them. Elizabeth? Yes, Chief? See to the fan who wears his proper clothes for a visit to the Earth. You can attend to all that. Yes, I will, Chief. Gee, it'll be nice wearing buckle shoes and long stockings again. I still have good-looking legs, you know. Nathaniel, men's styles have changed on Earth since you were there 300 years ago. They have? Women's, too? Oh, yes, many times. But now they have the new look, and they're right back to where they used to be. Oh. Well, don't men wear long stockings anymore? Oh, no. But don't worry, Nathaniel. Your knees will be covered. You'll wear long trousers. Why can't I just wear my toga? I'm so used to it now. Because, my dear Nathaniel, you don't, we don't want you to be conspicuous. You've got an important job to do. Oh. Well, Chief, how do I go about destroying the Earth? Horatio, hand me that horn. Yes, Chief. Here you are, sir. Now, Nathaniel... You simply blow four notes of the Judgment Day Overture on this horn, and that will be the end of the earth. Gee, it's the most beautiful trumpet I've ever seen. It is not a trumpet. Oh. It's a very special kind of horn. Now listen carefully to these instructions. You'll proceed to New Amsterdam. It's called New York now, Chief. Oh, New York, then. Mercurius will arrange for your transportation. You will then check into the Waldorf Biltmore Hotel, and a few minutes before midnight, you will go to the roof. Yes, sir. Now, this is very important, Nathaniel. The horn must be blown at midnight sharp. Yes, sir. Remember, that means precisely 12. 11.59 won't do, 12.01 won't do. It must be 12 on the dot. Got that? Yes, sir. I'll see that the horn blows at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to me. All right, now get going. If you do a good job, when you come back, you may find yourself an angel senior grade. Me, an angel senior grade. That means a raise in my base pay. God. <laughs> but if you botch the job, you'll be back scrubbing clouds for the next 500 years. Yeah, I hope not. My knees are still wet. But don't worry, Chief. I won't botch it. I'll make good. That's the spirit. Now, are you ready to, uh... The interplanetary phone, Chief. Department of Small Planets. Chief speaking. This is the salvage department. Any instructions, Chief? Yes. Stand by to pick up a load of scrap at midnight. Hmm. That'll be all, Nathaniel. Are you sure you remember everything? Don't worry, Chief. I won't forget a thing. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Come back here. You forgot the horn. Oh, that's because I'm so excited. Well, goodbye, Chief. Goodbye. Elizabeth, you stay with him until he leaves. See that he gets away in time. Yes, Chief. Come along, Nathaniel. I'll walk you to the edge. <laughs> I'm going to miss you, Nathaniel. You are, Elizabeth? Yes. Well, I'll only be gone. Hello, Nathaniel. Oh, hello, Noah. Going away? Yes, but I'll be home tomorrow. <laughs> well, when you get back, drop in. I'm having a little gathering in the ark. In the ark? Mm -hmm. Oh, good, good. Who's coming over? Oh, just a few couples. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. I'll see you later. Da 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 ding. Da 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 ding. What are we talking about, Elizabeth? I said that I was going to miss you. Oh, well, I'll only be gone one night, and then I, I'll come back, and we can spend the next hundred years together just talking about my trip. Gee, these earth clothes are funny. What do you call this again? That's a vest. And is this a doublet? No, that's a coat. Oh. But what is this label? I wouldn't want to wear someone else's clothes. 
poor Hart, Scheffner, and Mark. <laughs> Don't worry, Nathaniel. And by the way, I'd better give you some money. Here. What are these? Gilders? No, these are dollar bills. Oh. Well, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> See, they feel nice and crispy. And these are $5 bills. Oh, I like these better. They feel even nicer and crispier. Look at the pictures on them. George is on one and Abe is on the other. Yes. Yes, you'll need them, Nathaniel. And now you'd better go. I'm on my way, Elizabeth. Nathaniel! Nathaniel! Well, that's the chief. Gosh, I hope he isn't calling me back. Nathaniel, I'm glad I caught you before you left. There's one very important thing I forgot to tell you. What is it, chief? Before you blow that horn, be sure to check with Petrillo. I don't want any trouble with him. <laughs> oh, I will, chief. I will. Goodbye. 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 Daniel. Goodbye. Watch that first step. It's a pip. I will. I will. See you tomorrow. You're listening to the Ford Theater, which tonight is bringing you Jack Benny, starring in The Horn Blows at Midnight with Claude Rains. A brief pause now before Act Two, and some timely hints on car values from Frank Martin. There's an exciting time in store for many of you in the coming week that can make a world of difference in the pride and enjoyment you get out of motoring. That's the time which your Lincoln dealer invites you to spend behind the wheel of a new 1949 Lincoln Cosmopolitan, America's most distinctive fine car. And in just a few miles, you'll discover why the Lincoln Cosmopolitan has no rival. You will see at first glance that here is an automobile truly distinctive, exclusive in its styling with lines and looks that lift it apart from every other car on the road. You'll recognize as you sink back into the soft foam rubber cushion seats that no other car offers a more luxurious interior, more elegant interior refinements. You'll feel rich custom upholstery. You'll discover unhampered visibility through the huge one-piece windshield of curved safety glass that is almost five feet wide. You will whisk the windows up and down at the mere touch of a button. And as you drive this outstanding 1949 Lincoln Cosmopolitan, you will discover performance that you have never before known in a fine car. For the great new Lincoln V-Type 8 engine is unsurpassed for dependability, economy, and efficiency. It's so powerfully smooth, so thrillingly quiet, so effortless in its range of acceleration. You can't believe it until you drive the new Lincoln Cosmopolitan. In all the world, there is no other fine car so beautifully new, so thoroughly owner-proven, so superbly engineered as this new 1949 Lincoln Cosmopolitan. Yet it costs very, very little more to own than an ordinary car. Take just a few minutes in the coming week, or even better, tomorrow, to accept your Lincoln dealer's invitation to meet this superb 1949 automobile the new Lincoln Cosmopolitan. You know you're driving America's most distinctive fine car, and so does the rest of the world when you drive the new 1949 Lincoln Cosmopolitan. Now again, Fletcher Markle. And here's the second act of The Horn Blows at Midnight, starring Jack Benny as Nathaniel with Claude Rains as the chief of the small planet. Now, Nathaniel, having arrived in New York City, is strolling down Broadway with the horn tucked under his arm. Since it was 300 years ago that he last saw this famous street, it's small wonder that he marvels at the changes. So this is New York. I wonder why they changed the name. Look at that sign over there, baseball today. Boston Red Sox and New York Yankees. Well, I guess it does sound better than new Amsterdam Yankees. <laughs> Gosh, this place certainly is built up. I wish Peter Stuyvesant could see it. How they laugh when we bought Manhattan Island for $24. I bet we could double our money now. <laughs> My, what big buildings. I never saw so many horseless carriages. Look at those yellow ones. See, they go around the corner on two wheels. I wonder if they could... <laughs> Get back on the curb, you jerk. You wanted to kill? No, thank you. Not again. <laughs> the records would be all mixed up. Hey, Doesn't mister. It? Better wait for the light to change before you cross the street. Light? Light to change? 
Sure. You must be a stranger. Ain't you never been in New York before? Oh, yes, yes. I come from New York. But I've been away for a long time. Say, that's a good-looking trumpet you got there. Yeah. How about giving us a little bebop? Bebop? Yeah. <laughs> that bebop or rebop? Bebop or... Is that music? Is it? It's out of this world. Well, that's where I've been, and I've never heard of it. <laughs> Bebop a rebop. Huh? What band are you with? Uh, Beethoven's Ethereal Melodians. It's a very fine orchestra. Ten thousand pieces. Ten thousand? Gee, they must sound louder than Spike Jones. <laughs> Spike who? Jones. Didn't you ever hear him play All I Want for Christmas is my two front teeth? No, but it sounds like a very interesting selection. I'll suggest it to Mr. Beethoven. <laughs> Beethoven, huh? Yes, I play 455th trumpet. I've been playing it for nearly 300 years. Hey, Johnny, this guy must be a little hut's name, like a fruitcake. Uh, what's your name, Methuselah? No, no, but I know him very well. <laughs> I, uh, in fact, I went to his birthday party last month, and he had the biggest cake. Took us two weeks to blow out the candles. <laughs> hey, Jerry, let's get out of here before the wagon backs up. Yeah. <laughs> well, so long, Grandpa. Give my regards to Beethoven. I will, I will. <laughs> Look at them run away. They were nice youngsters, though. You know, people aren't so bad down here. <laughs> My, the streets are certainly crowded here in New York. Look at all those men and women going into that theater. Hamlet by William Shakespeare. Good old Bill. Wait till I tell him about this. He'll be so happy to know he's finally got a hit. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, look at all the saloons on this street. I wonder what kind of a drink television is. <laughs> I don't remember it. What's that big bird going up there in the sky? So noisy, too. Spelling out something. I.J. Fox. Must be a store up there. No, no, that would be impossible. There he is, officer! That's him! Oh, yes. Well, I'll handle him, kid. Hey, you there. You the horn. Huh? Were you speaking to me? Yeah. Well, I understand you've been playing that trumpet you got there for the last 300 years. Yes, sir. I, I'm with Beethoven's Ethereal Melodians. Oh, you are, eh? Well, what's your name? Nathaniel, third phalanx, 15th cohort. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, exactly how old are you? Uh, 355. Of course, I tell everyone up there that I'm 339. <laughs> I'm really 355. Oh, oh, naughty, naughty, you're a bad boy. Well, it's only a white lie. You know, I, I just can't get over how this town has changed, and the people, too. Where are the Indians? In Cleveland. Yeah, Bob Hope's got them now. <laughs> Bob Hope? Sure, the big radio comedian. Don't tell me you've never listened to Hope. No, what did he say? Hmm. <laughs> now, uh, would you mind if I ask oh, look, you... Look, look. I may be wrong, but I think that's the spot right there. Huh? The place where I was killed 300 years ago. You were what? I was killed here 300 years ago. I was run over by a cow. <laughs> <laughs> I really was. A hit and moo driver. <laughs> Mr. Beethoven gets mad when I tell jokes like that. <laughs> but it was my own fault, you know. I shouldn't have been out so late. Yes, well, look, uh, uh, uh... Nathaniel, third phalanx, 15th cohort. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> look, Nathaniel, when did they let you out? A little while ago. Well, you're, you're going back, aren't you? Oh, of course. I just have to blow a few notes on this horn tonight, and then I'll return immediately. Oh. Well, why wait till tonight? Why not blow the horn now? Oh, I, I couldn't do that. You see, the chief said it wouldn't work unless it was exactly midnight on the dot. The chief said that, eh? Yes, sir. Oh. 
Well, I guess there's no harm in letting you run along. But you'll remember to go right home as soon as you blow the, blow the bugle. Oh, yes, yes, I will. I certainly will. Just as long as I blew it, I will. <laughs> well, well, goodbye. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. Oh, no, you won't. If you've been good, I will. <laughs> Goodbye. My, what a nice man. Step right inside the store here, folks. The auction is about to begin. Now, friends, I have here my hair on a timepiece that is acknowledged all over the civilized world as the finest example of watchmaking that human hands can create. My friends, just look at this watch. Look at the solid 14-carat gold-type case. Gold-type case? The jewel die, consisting of 24 genuine artificial diamonds. The real synthetic alligator strap fit for a king's wrist. Gee. Ah, you like it, don't you? Well, I don't blame you, friends. Now, who'll start the bidding at $300? Have a bid 300, 300, 300. Who'll say 300? One dollar. One dollar. I'm Billy Dollar. All right, who'll make it a dollar and a half? Why, friends, the movement alone is worth that much. Who'll say a dollar and a half? A dollar and a half? A dollar and a half? Can anyone say a dollar and a half? I can say a dollar and a half. <laughs> a dollar and a half. See, I said it. <laughs> so, to the intelligent looking man with the horn for a dollar and a half. Congratulations, sir. Here you are. Thank you, sir. My friend, you have a watch there that will last you a hundred years. A hundred years? What will I do with it after that? Oh, well, I'll think of something. <laughs> I wonder where the Waldorf Biltmore Hotel is. That's where I have to go. I better ask someone. Watch Street, get your pipers here. Watch Street, read all about it. I beg your pardon, but I'm... A, a... piper? You want a piper, mister? Piper? Uh, what's a piper? A paper. <laughs> no, no, thank you. But could you uh, could you direct me to the Waldorf Biltmore Hotel? Oh, Sonny, Sonny, it's one block down and two blocks to the right. Thank you. I understand it's a lovely place. Head at best. <laughs> I wouldn't live nowhere else. Oh, then you live there? Sure, I got the penthouse there. I just sell these papers for a hobby. My dad owns the four-way coal tablets. Oh. Well, if you have the penthouse, we'll be neighbors. I'll see you over there. That is, if you get home before midnight. Well, thanks again. Goodbye. Goodbye. I don't know where they come from, but I always get them. Poipers, get your poipers here. Poipers. Da-da-da, ding. Da-da-da, ding. Yeah, it was nice of him to direct me to the hotel. The earth can't be so bad with people like him on it. I wonder if the chief isn't making a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't. Oh, oh! I didn't say it, chief. I was just thinking. It's just that it seems such a pity. I mean, there's so many nice people. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it, chief. Don't worry. I'll do it. See, Elizabeth, he's weakening already. I told you he was the wrong one to send. But, Chief, he'll do it. He said he would. He's on his way to the hotel now. I've got a good mind to recall him and send someone I can rely on. Oh, please, Chief, don't do that. Nathaniel's all right. It's just that he has such a soft heart. Well, I should have sent an older angel. Nathaniel is only 339. Anyway, that's what he says. But, Chief... How he got to look like that in only 339 years, <laughs> I'll never know. <laughs> I'm worried, Elizabeth. Oh, why don't you wait and see? I'm sure everything will be all right. It better be. If that horn doesn't blow at midnight, I'll drop him out of the phalanx. So this is the Waldorf Biltmore. My, what a beautiful hotel. Sure is crowded, too. Paging Mr. Davis, Mr. Charles Davis. Paging Mr. Davis. Paging Mr. Caesar. Mr. Caesar, please. I'll take it, boy. Is that for Julius? No, sir. Irving. 
Oh, oh, I don't know him. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Caesar. Mr. Hating Caesar. Oh, fiddlesticks. I wanted to ask him how to get to the roof. So near midnight. I'll ask that man at the desk. Boy, take this luggage up to 1023, huh? Oh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Could you tell me how to get to the roof? Why, yes, sir. You take that last elevator. It's an express. Thank you. And uh, is that clock up there on the wall correct? Yes, sir. It's exactly ten minutes before midnight. You're quite certain? Oh, yes, sir. The sun rises and sets by that clock. I'm afraid you've been misinformed, if you don't mind my saying so. See, the sun's movements are completely independent of this planet. However, I will accept the time as 11.51 p.m. Thank you very much. I'm sure Western Union will be deeply grateful. <laughs> oh, that's perfectly all right. Are you stopping at the hotel, sir? Yes, for a short time. You staying overnight? No, and neither are you. <laughs> well, goodbye. Going up? Yes, the roof, please. That's a lovely elevator you have here. Eh, when you've seen one, you've seen them all. I suppose so. Is your name Otis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how'd you guess? Otis J. Elevator, that's me. I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Nathaniel, third phalanx, 15th cohort. <laughs> Why, it's nice in here, so intimate and cozy. Eh, it ain't so cozy when you have to stand in it all night long. All night long? Well, from six at night till two in the morning. Really? Then I have good news for you. Tonight you're getting off at 12. <laughs> hey, that's funny. The chief didn't tell me anything about it. Well, he told me. Well, I hope you're right. Uh, here's the roof, sir. Thank you. Da 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 dee. Da 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 dee. Yeah, I wish I could get that right. Da 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 dee. What a beautiful sight up here on the roof. And all the stars are out tonight. There's Jupiter, Mercury, and Venus. Hello, Venus. Gee, she's pretty. Well, it's only five more minutes till midnight. Better get ready to blow the horn. Here's a good place to stand, right near the edge. I think I... What's that? Is someone there? Why, it's a girl, and she's crying. Uh, don't cry, miss. Whatever it is that's troubling you will be over very soon. It'll never be over. Never. Never. Oh, yes. Yes, it will. And just a couple of minutes. Please go away. Let me alone, can't you? But I assure you, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. He doesn't love me. He's sending me away. Well, I won't go back home. I won't. <laughs> You can't very well go back home if you're not alive. Not... not alive? Yes, of course. That's the answer, the only answer. It's all clear now. Well, I'm very happy to have been of service. <laughs> Less than two minutes left. I'll show him. I wonder what he'll say when I'm gone. Well, here goes. Goodbye, Andrew. Wait, wait, you mustn't. You mustn't jump. Let me go. No, no, you can't. Why not? It was your idea. But suicide is a mortal sin. You let go of me. Be patient. Just a few more seconds. No, I won't be tossed out of it. Let me go. You've got to listen to me now. There's very little time. Hey, Peggy. Peggy. Andrew. <laughs> what? Who's this? Oh, Peggy, darling. Hey, you get your hands off my girl. Let go of me, mister. It's midnight. I've got to blow my horn. I ought to jam it down your throat. My horn? <laughs> oh, let him go, Andrew. He didn't do anything. Oh, Peggy, I've been such a fool. Can you ever forgive me? As soon as you left, I realized what a mistake I made. Oh, Peggy, I'll never let you go again, believe me. Well, let go of me, then, and put your arms around her. Please, Andrew, it's midnight. i got to blow the horn. Oh, Andrew, I'm so happy I could start crying all over again. Look, not tonight, baby. We're going to celebrate. Come on. Wait, wait, give me back my horn. Here you are, bud. Catch. Whoops! I missed it. I missed it. It's falling all the way down to the street. I won't have time to get it. What am I going to do? No, I'll never get to be an angel senior grade. What am I going to tell the chief? I couldn't help the chief. 
I couldn't help it. Give me another chance. Please, Chief, please. Just one more chance. I want to be a senior. <laughs> That's act two of tonight's Ford Theater presentation of The Horn Blows at Midnight, starring Jack Benny with Claude Rains. Time out again very briefly, and Frank Martin speaking for the Ford Motor Company. A gold medal is quite an impressive thing, particularly when it's awarded to the car chosen as the fashion car of the year. That gold medal has just been awarded to the 1949 Ford. Bearing out the judgment of millions of Americans, the Fashion Academy of New York, after examining all cars in all price ranges, picked the 1949 Ford as embodying all the essential qualities of good taste, modern design, and subtle harmony in line and color. Yes, the style experts have officially awarded the gold medal to the 1949 Ford for its beauty and advanced styling that set Ford apart in its field. And this recognition of Ford styling is not an accident. The 1949 Ford is the only completely newly designed car in its field. Ford engineers, designers, and stylists redesigned the Ford from roof to road, creating a completely new car to give you better, safer, easier driving. Truly modern motoring. And one basic part of that redesigning is Ford's new style, an advanced style that suits a truly advanced car, a style that expresses in steel and glass and chrome, the power, comfort, safety, and solid roadability, the advanced performance of the new Ford. Back of every point of Ford styling, you will find a good reason. More headroom, legroom, seat room, luggage room. More visibility, more safety, more comfort, more efficient performance. And above all, better, easier driving. The 1949 Ford, alone in its field, was completely redesigned to give you those things. And it does. The 1949 Ford is not just a remodeled pre-war car, but the most advanced car in its field, the truly modern, truly post-war car. You can tell how advanced 1949 Ford styling is by looking at a new Ford and then looking at other new cars of older style. But you won't know how truly advanced it is until you drive a 1949 Ford, until you take the wheel and feel the difference. Feel the big difference that Ford's advanced design makes. Why not ask one of your friends to let you drive his new Ford or see your friendly Ford dealer? When you drive a Ford, you'll feel different. Drive a Ford and feel the difference. <laughs> Ford Theater presentation of The Horn Blows at Midnight will be resumed after a brief pause for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Fletcher Markle again, and now for the third act of The Horn Blows at Midnight, starring Jack Benny as Nathaniel and Claude Rains as the Chief. Elizabeth, of all the angels who could have done the job, you had to recommend Nathaniel. But, Chief, it wasn't his fault. Nathaniel was only trying to stop that poor girl from committing suicide, a mortal sin. Well, that wasn't his job. He should have obeyed orders. There are too many people down there committing mortal sins. That's why Earth has to be destroyed. Please, Chief, give Nathaniel another chance. After all, you've only lost one day. I know, I know, but Nathaniel has botched up every assignment I ever gave him. Remember two months ago when I put him in the weather department? All he had to do was to see that the clouds went in the right direction. And what happened? He got the elements so mixed up it snowed in California. <laughs> Nathaniel. Nathaniel Bob. No, but Chief, that was an accident. After all, he was new on the job and he just didn't know. Imagine snow in California. He knows very well it's not even supposed to rain there. 
That's where we keep our smog. <laughs> no, Elizabeth, I have no alternative. Nathaniel must be recalled. Chief, if you recall Nathaniel now, you'll destroy all his confidence. He tried so hard to make good. He was so happy at the chance to become an angel, senior grade. If you take that chance away from him, you'll break his spirit. And that's all he's got left. <laughs> oh, please, Chief. Be just a little more patient with him, won't you? Elizabeth, I don't know why I let you talk me into these things, but you always do. Then you'll give Nathaniel another chance. Oh, thank you, Chief, thank you. You're so good and kind, and he'll be so grateful. Well, you better blow that horn at midnight tonight, or else. And that's my last word, else. I'll thunder him his directions. <laughs> It certainly was nice of the chief to give me another chance. Lucky this horn didn't break when it hit the street. I'll just have to make good tonight. Let's see, there's still a little time before midnight. I guess I'll sit here in the lobby for a while. Certainly is a busy hotel. Paging Mr. Caesar, Mr. Irving Caesar, please. Hmm, same one he paged yesterday. I'll have to ask Julius if he has any relatives down here. <laughs> Julius is so nice. I think Brutus was definitely out of line. <laughs> well, I got about 15 minutes yet. Yeah, I hope nothing goes wrong this time. Pardon me. May I sit down here? Oh, why, certainly. Certainly, there's plenty of room. Oh, thank you. Whoops. Wait till I remove the horn. <laughs> there you are. Thank you. Isn't this a beautiful hotel? Yes, yes, it is. I've had such a busy day. And you know, in about an hour, the limousine is coming back for me, and I have to go to a midnight supper at the Stork Club. Really? Yes, and then I'll have to go home and get some rest, because tomorrow I have so much more to do. I'm going to Saks Fifth Avenue and buy a complete wardrobe for my trip to Honolulu. Oh, you're going to Honolulu? Oh, yes, I have to go. You see, I hit the giant jackpot on singing again, and I've been traveling ever since. <laughs> I, uh, I don't understand. And not what... only that, they painted my house inside and out, and it looks so strange now. Oh. I loved it the way it was. <laughs> Well, look, a lady... I'm Mrs. Watson. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Watson? My name is Nathaniel. Nathaniel? A third phalanx, 15th cohort. <laughs> oh, I've never been there. Oh, no, no, it isn't a place. Paging Jack Benny. Mr. Jack Benny, please. Paging Jack Benny. Uh, Mrs. Watson, what oh, I meant oh, to say... Oh, wait a minute. Did you hear that? What? They're paging Jack Benny. Jack Benny? Yes. Haven't you ever heard him on the radio? Well, well, no, no. Oh, I, I, I... I hope he's living in this hotel. I might see him. He's simply wonderful. <laughs> I listen to him every Sunday, even though I can't win anything. Oh, <laughs> oh. Well, what does this You Benny... know the thing I like about him? What? He pretends to be stingy and cheap, and I'm sure he's not that way at all. <laughs> he, uh, he isn't? No, I can tell just by listening to him that he's the sweetest, kindest, and the most generous man in the whole world. <laughs> oh. Well, it's nice to know there are people like that. <laughs> and you want to know something? I almost met him a year ago. You did? Yes, I guessed he was the walking man, but they never called me on the phone. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Well, I better wait out in front of the hotel now. The limousine will be coming any minute. The limousine? Yes. Governor Dewey is the one who has to take me to the stork club. That's part of the jackpot. <laughs> Well, goodbye, Mrs. Watson. It was nice talking to you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Phalanx. Uh, no, no, no. It's a thank you. <laughs> Daniel, third Phalanx, 15th cohort. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Well, now, that was the sweetest old... Oh, my goodness. That nice old lady thinks she's going to Honolulu tomorrow. And I have to... Oh, no. <laughs> Look, Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth, look. Nathaniel is weakening. Who cares whether anybody goes to Honolulu or not? He cares, Chief. He worries about everything. That's why he's so... so... Stupid? That's what he is, stupid. I still say we sent the wrong angel. No, you didn't, Chief. He still has time. He'll go through with it. Then what's he sitting there for? Why doesn't he go up on the roof and get ready? Look, look what he's doing down there now, biting his nails. Well, he's nervous. Nervous about what? Destroying one of our smallest planets? It's ridiculous. Well, warn him again, Chief, so he'll know it's almost midnight. All right, all right. I'll send him another thundergram. Yes, yes, Chief, I know. Well, I still got about seven minutes. Gee, I hope nothing goes wrong this time. Hello, monsieur. Huh? Oh, oh, hello, little girl. Hello. Are you lost? No, monsieur, I am not lost. Oh. Oh, I thought the way you were looking at me, you you wanted to ask me something. No, no. You just seem so sad, sitting here all by yourself. I am sad. Why, monsieur? Because of something I have to do at midnight. I'm worried about it. Well, you mustn't worry. My mother told me, even when we were in the camp, not to be sad, because someday everything would be all right. The, uh, the camp? You were in... A prison camp, monsieur, back in France. Oh. Oh, I see. Did you do something wrong? No, monsieur. Well, uh... Would you like a piece of my candy bar, monsieur? No, thank you. Although I haven't had a bite since I came down here. <laughs> Except my nails. <laughs> <laughs> then please take a bite of the chocolate bar. Well, thanks. Thanks. What's your name? Angelique. Angelique? That means little angel in French. Oui, monsieur. You know, I'm an angel, too. <laughs> I'm a big angel. <laughs> What's your name? Nathaniel, third phalanx, 15th cohort. <laughs> What's your cohort? I don't know. Je ne comprends pas. Oh, then you haven't been in this country long. No, we just came on the boat this morning from France. Oh, and did you say you were in a prison camp? Yes, me and my mama. For three whole years. Then the Americans came and got us out. Oh. Well, where's your mommy and your daddy? Well, my mama is right over there. But I don't know where my daddy is. He used to be a soldier. Oh. Oh, well, Angelique, how is it that you speak English so well? Mama has been teaching me a long time. Three whole years. Three years? I suppose that is quite a long time for a mortal. Especially such a small mortal. And you don't know where your father is? No, monsieur. But Mama said he was the most wonderful man in the world. And we're all going to be together again someday. Angelique? Angelique? Is see, Mama? Here I am. Oh, I was worried when I didn't see you. Oh, she's quite all right. We were just sitting here talking. He is a very nice man, Mama. Angelique, were you annoying this gentleman? Oh, no, 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 not at all. We had a, such a nice chat. And Angelique was telling me what a wonderful man her father is. And <sighs> you're all going to be together again. Is he in New York? Uh, no, monsieur. Angelique uh, would not understand, but he is... Uh, he's... Well, he was a great hero. Oh, I see. And you just arrived from France this morning? Huh? Yes. Uh, tonight we are going to take the train to Chicago. We are going to live with relatives there. I have not seen them for over ten years. But they have asked us to come to them. Well, that will be nice. Then your little girl can grow up in a good home-like... Oh, uh-oh. Oh, my goodness. What am I saying? You look sad again. Yes, yeah, I just remembered something. Mama, Mama, can I have another piece of candy? Angelique, I just gave you a whole bar. I know, but I offered to share it with this man, and he ate the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. I just meant to take a bite. Yes. Well, here's some money. You can buy another bar right over there. Thank you, Mama. You know, Monsieur, Angelique does not know that her father is dead. Yes, I realize that. She's too young to understand. 
You see, she was just an infant when he was killed. Monsieur, you don't think there can be another war, do you? Well, not if I... No, I don't think so. Another war would mean the end of everything. There is not a country in the world that could go through it again. Not the way they fight wars now. People would just destroy each other. They would? Oh, yes, monsieur, yes. And yet it seems very simple for a lot of people to forget about the time of war. They do not want to remember. But we must remember, monsieur, all of us, and take care, or we will die for it. Now it is time for people to get to know each other. Now it is time for people to come together in the world. But there's very little time left, you see. I know, monsieur. Oh, you do? Of course. If we do not change ourselves soon, it will be too late. Though the war is over, there is much still not settled. It may take five years or even ten years before we find the answer to real happiness and understanding. But we will find it, monsieur. We must now reach out to each other and find out about each other. By coming here, Angelique and I have a chance to do that. And we are grateful. We must find peace with each other, monsieur. Or we are lost. Yes, yes, I'm sure you're right. But you see... Mama, I have another candy bar. Would you like to share it with me, monsieur? No, no, thank you. I've, I've had enough. Well, come on, Angelique. We must go. Uh, goodbye, monsieur. Uh, monsieur... Nathaniel, third phalanx, 15th cohort. <laughs> Uh, goodbye, Angelique. Goodbye, monsieur. Goodbye. Hmm. What a cute little girl. Spent three years of her life in a prison camp. Now it's getting near midnight. Better take the elevator up to the roof. Going up, sir? Yes, yes, the roof, please. Well, here's the roof, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Well, it's almost midnight. I'm sure glad it's a nice night. It's the last one. Keep thinking about that little girl, Angelique and her mother. They seem so nice. All they wanted the chance to live together in peace. Maybe most people are good. Maybe the war has been a lesson. If that's true, then the Earth shouldn't be destroyed. Chief. Chief, do you think that I ought to go... But, Chief, you heard what she said, that little girl's mother. They've never had a chance before. Let them have it now. While they... But, Chief, look, there must be millions of others just like them who need time to get to know each other. We have such hopes for the future. This is what Angelique's father gave his life for, to give other people a chance. And now you want to take it away from him. Chief, let's wait a while. Look, Chief, look. I suppose all these people down here don't get together. Suppose there is another war. Then the whole world will destroy itself. They'll blow the earth to pieces. And then remember, Chief, that would take the responsibility off your shoulders. You won't be to blame. See? See what I mean, Chief? You've waited this long, thousands and thousands of years. What harm is there waiting a little longer? Give them a chance. Maybe they'll get to work and live together in peace. Everything will straighten itself out, and it'll be the way you want it to be. What was that, Chief? Oh. Then I won't have to blow the horn? I'm glad you changed your mind. Well, I'd like to come back now, Chief. I'd like to see you and Elizabeth and Horatio. And I'd even like to see Mr. Beethoven, too, even though he does holler at me all the time. From now on, I'm going to practice real hard and make him proud of me. Thanks, Chief. 
I'll leave right now. Going down, mister? Yeah? Going down? No, thank you. Up. From the Ford Theater in Hollywood, you have just heard Mr. Jack Benny starring in The Horn Blows at Midnight. Tonight's version for listening was prepared by Hugh Wedlock and Howard Snyder, and the original musical score was composed and conducted by Cy Fuhr. The Ford Theater, a full hour of dramatic entertainment, is brought to you every Friday by the Ford Motor Company, builder of Lincoln and Mercury cars, Ford trucks and farm tractors, and the new 1949 Ford car, officially chosen as the fashion car of the year. It's Ford for the new look in styling, and it's Ford for the new feel in driving. Drive a Ford and feel the difference. Now again, Mr. Markle. May a director identify the principals in our cast tonight. In the foreground... The chief. ...was played, of course, by Mr. Claude Rains, who will soon be seen in the Hal Wallace production, Rope of Sand. Elizabeth. ...was played by Mercedes McCambridge. Angelique. ...was Anne Whitfield. Angelique's mother. ...was played by Jeanette Nolan. Mrs. Watson. ...was Jane Morgan. Mr. Beethoven. ...was Hans Conrad. Jerry. ...and Johnny. ...were played by Jerry Farber and Johnny McGovern. Actively assisting were Paul McVeigh, Miriam Wolfe, Eddie Marr, Joseph Kearns, Jay Novello, Julian Upton, Sidney Miller... Herb Vigran, Byron Kane, and uh, Shirley Mitchell. Anybody else? Yes, Nathaniel. Was played by Jack Benny. <laughs> Jack, I've uh, got a confession to make. What is it, Fletcher? After all the kidding we did on your program about the horn blows at midnight, I have to admit now that I never saw the picture. You didn't? I just couldn't bring myself to walk into the theater. Why? It's a complex I have, Jack, the fear of being alone. <laughs> oh. Well, anyway, Fletcher, I want to tell you it was really nice doing this show for you tonight, and I promise you one thing. If I ever make another bad picture, you can have first crack at it. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. By the way, just one more question before I give you your check. Oh, the check. Yes, yes. It, you know, it slipped my mind. <laughs> Get your hand out of my pocket. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, excuse me. What is it you wanted to ask me, Fletcher? Well, you always kid so much about your age. Tell me, Jack, and be on the level this time. How old are you, really? Fletcher, I'm 39. Now, cut that out! <laughs> so long, Fletcher. Goodbye, Jack, and see you again. We'll be listening to your regular program on CBS this coming Sunday night, and Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman will be your guest. Now it's for next week. Next week on the Ford Theater, we're going to have a story with music. Our star is Mr. Bing Crosby, and our story is one of his most recent films, Welcome Stranger. It's a pleasant portrait of a young doctor who goes to a small New England town so that the local physician can take his first vacation and then suddenly find himself an unwelcome stranger. We're very happy to have with Mr. Crosby, Mr. Barry Fitzgerald, playing his original role, and we'll be welcoming back Miss Anne Blythe for a return visit. We hope you'll be with us. And now until next week, until Bing Crosby, Anne Blythe, and Barry Fitzgerald in Welcome Stranger, this is Fletcher Markle with a good night and thank you from all of us in the Ford Theater. <laughs> The Horn Blows at Midnight was presented through the courtesy of Warner Brothers, producers of the Academy-nominated Johnny Belinda, starring Jane Wyman and Lou Ayers. The Ford Motor Company invites you to join us again next week at this hour to hear Bing Crosby, Barry Fitzgerald, and Anne Blythe starring in Welcome Stranger. This is Frank Martin speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.